Hello. So today I want to start by introducing a new chapter, the chapter on rotational motion. Um, so at the beginning of this chapter we have to introduce a whole bunch of new definitions and new um, quantities. But first I want to remind you of a little bit of what we already talked about a few chapters ago regarding uniform circular motion. So remember that when an object um, travels in a circle, it's considered uniform um, circular motion if the object moves in a circular path with a constant speed. Um, and we said that even though the speed is constant, since the direction is constantly changing because the particle is moving in a circle, then there's still an acceleration. Okay. So in uniform, um, uniform circular motion, you have a constantly changing direction and so you have an acceleration. And remember we talked about that being the centripetal acceleration. For circular motion, your velocity vector is always tangent to the path of the object. If you were to um, get rid of whatever was providing the centripetal force, then the particle would fly off in a path tangent to the direction of the circle. Now, it's pretty easy to discuss circular motion for point particles and rigid objects, and that's what we're going to do in this chapter. It's kind of a nightmare if the object is deformable or not rigid. Imagine um, circular motion for a bucket of water, for example, and the water sloshing around in the bucket. If you were trying to model the rotation of, say, one of those water molecules, that would be really difficult. Okay, So we're going to stick to rigid objects where the relative locations of all the particles making up the object remain constant. Truthfully, all real objects are deformable to some extent, but for the purposes here, we're going to ignore that, um, which allows us to do um, some pretty nice equations to model it that are relatively simple. Now, in purely rotational motion, and by that I mean an object is not also translating in space, but is just sitting and spinning, okay? So that's more like a merry-go-round, or say for example a CD spinning, um, than say for example the wheel of a tire which is rolling across the ground. So we're going to start off with something just spinning. All right. Now, let's say that you have uh, this gray or this brown disc, let's say it's a record or a CD or something. Let's look at the motion of one point on that CD, and we'll call it a point P. Okay. Now, if you draw a line from the axis of rotation, here labeled by O, to the P, then you have um, that red line there. Now, our axis of rotation um, is running through here the middle of that object, okay? And the axis of rotation is perpendicular to the plane of the object. So the axle or whatever that would be holding this thing on its rotational motion is perpendicular to the object itself. All right, so we can define uh, the angle in radians through which an object turns. We can relate that to the arc. Uh, length that the object makes as it turns through, here indicated with uh, kind of a, an L on this drawing right here. So that's an arc length, and then we relate that angle to the arc length and to the radius of the circle that that point P would draw out as it goes through its rotational motion. So if you say theta is equal to L over R, then you have the equation relating the angle and radians to the arc length and the radius of that circle. Now, the radians is a different unit than we typically use for angles, so you're probably really used to thinking about angles in terms of degrees. If you want to convert from radians to degrees, you just use the conversion that 360 degrees, which makes up a full circle, is 2 pi radians, or that half of a circle is pi radians and 180 degrees. So you just multiply or divide um, by those quantities as you need to go from degrees to radians. It might interest you to know that one radian is the angle subtended when your arc length and your radius are the same. Okay? Um, these units, of course, they come from perfect circles. The ancients were quite fascinated, um, particularly the ancient Greeks, were really fascinated by the idea that if you take any old circle you want, as long as it's a perfect circle, and you take the circumference of that circle and you divide it by the diameter of the circle, you'll always get pi. Okay, so that's where this basis of these um, units and radians comes from. Okay, there's pi radians in 180 degrees. Let's define some of the quantities that we'll need for these equations. Let's define an angular displacement. The angular displacement is defined as the angle that the object rotates through during some time interval. 
Uh, the equation for delta theta, since it's a displacement, is your final minus your initial angle in radians. So um, angular displacements, we're going to define counterclockwise rotations as positive. And so what that means is that your angular displacement will be positive if the rotation is counterclockwise. Okay? So most of the time what we'll do is we'll measure an angle counterclockwise from the plus x axis. You might remember that. We already did that a lot when we talked about vectors and taking vector components. If I use that definition for angular displacement, delta theta is equal to theta 2 minus theta 1, then I can also figure out what my angular velocity or my angular speed is. I take that angular displacement and then I divide it by the time that it took to go through that displacement. So your average angular velocity is delta theta over delta t. Okay? If you instead you want to know what the angular velocity is in the particular instant, what you have to do is shrink that delta t down and you'll get what's known as an instantaneous angular velocity. Remember that your average might be different from your instantaneous value if the thing is speeding up or slowing down during your time interval. The units, the SI units that we're going to use for angular speed are radians per second. Okay? Since radians is really a dimensionless number because your theta is equal to L over R, which is a distance divided by a distance, so truly it's dimensionless. Um, uh, since that is radians per second, it's really just inverse seconds. Okay? And of course, your angular speed and displacement will be positive if theta is increasing. What that means is if it's a counterclockwise rotation. And your angular speed and displacement will be negative if theta is decreasing, which would mean it's going through a counterclockwise rotation. Finally, we're going to define an angular acceleration. An angular acceleration is the rate at which the angular velocity changes with time. So that's delta omega over delta t um, for an average angular acceleration. And then yet again, if you want to know what the instantaneous acceleration is, you have to shrink it down to some tiny little delta t. Now, I find that students often get really confused about uh, negative angular accelerations and what that means. Does it mean it's speeding up or does it mean it's slowing down? Remember that in vectors, and these are vectors because they have a direction, remember we've defined counterclockwise as positive and clockwise as negative, okay? So that indicates the direction. The sign is indicated by the direction. Just like in translational motion, if your angular um, velocity and your angular acceleration are in the same direction, then the object will speed up, okay? And if they're in opposite directions, then the object will slow its rotation. So I've depicted that in some cartoons here down at the bottom. So if you have a clockwise rotation and a clockwise angular acceleration, then it's speeding up counterclockwise. For that case, both omega and alpha will be greater than zero. But your object is also speeding up if they're going both clockwise. So in that case, omega would be negative and so would alpha, okay? That's speeding up clockwise. Now, if it's slowing down, then what that means is that they have to point in opposite directions. So if your instantaneous angular velocity is counterclockwise, but your angular acceleration is clockwise, it'll slow down and vice versa, okay? If the speed is clockwise and the acceleration is counterclockwise, then it'll also slow down. So just remember the directional components and that omega and alpha have to be in the same direction for it to speed up and opposite directions for it to slow down. Okay, now let's define the frequency of the rotation. So the frequency of the rotation is the number of complete revolutions that the object undergoes in each second. We'll define a revolution as going around one full time. So if you marked a point on the object, then it would take you would time the amount of time that it would take to come all the way around once. That would be the period. Okay, so that's the period. That's the inverse of the frequency. And the number of times that it does that each second is the frequency. To find the frequency, you can take your angular speed or velocity and divide that by 2 pi. And that'll give you the number of revolutions per second. Because, of course, there's 2 pi radians and 1 revolution. And the dimensions of omega are radians per second. Okay? Frequencies, the SI unit of the frequency is the hertz. And 1 hertz is 1 inverse second. And then the period is the time that it takes for one revolution. To find the period, you take the inverse of the frequency.
Now, every point on a rotating body has an angular velocity omega, but it also has a tangential or linear velocity v. You can relate these two things together, okay? They're related via the equation v is equal to r omega, where v is your tangential speed, r is the radius, and omega is the angular speed, all right? What this means is that objects that are farther from the axis of rotation will move faster. You've probably experienced this on the playground, on one of those little merry-go-rounds on the playground. If you're standing close to the center of the merry-go-round, you don't feel like you're being whipped around quite so fast. But if you walk to the edge of the merry-go-round, that's a much more fun ride, okay? Let me do an old school example for you. Um, I got my first LP um, when I was in first or second grade, and it was Michael Jackson's Thriller, so that just dates me a little bit. But um, the LP stands for Long Play. Um, they usually lasted about 25 minutes if you listen to one side of a record. It was about 25 minutes or so, so it was a long time, um, as opposed to one of the little records, which was a, maybe just a couple songs. Um, so there, they rotate um, with an angular speed of 33 and a third revolutions per minute. Um, and it was a micro groove, groove vinyl record. Groove is in an actual groove that the needle fits into, not grooving, okay? Uh, micro groove vinyl record. It, so it's basically a plastic material. Uh, and it was the format that was accepted and introduced by Columbia Records in 1948 and then adopted by the whole industry as a new standard. These things had a diameter of about 12 inches, okay? Um, so what this question asks is what's the period in seconds, the frequency in hertz, the angular speed in radians per second, and the tangential speed at the record's edge in both meters per second and miles per hour. So this example just kind of plays with uh, unit conversion more than anything else. So here, omega is the angular speed, and that was already given in the problem in terms of revolutions per minute, but let's do a conversion to radians per second. So 33 and a third revolutions per minute, there's one revolution, two pi radians, so that's the conversion there to multiply by two pi, and to get from minutes to seconds, you just divide by 60. So if you do those things, and you get 3.5 radians per second, for your um, new angular speed. Now, if you want to find the frequency of rotation, you take omega and divide it by 2 pi. If I do that with the numbers that I have, I get 0 0.56 hertz, okay? Now, if I want to find the period, that's 1 over the frequency, okay? So 1 over 0.56 hertz is 1.8 seconds. So if you timed it, it would take 1.8 seconds for the record to go around one time. V is equal to omega r, so if you want the speed of a point on the edge of the record, then you would multiply your angular speed, 3.5 radians per second, times the radius of the record. Now the diameter was 12 inches, so 12 inches divided by 2 gives you 6 inches, so that's what I plugged in there. But now we wanted our speed in terms of meters per second um, first, so let's convert from inches to meters. There's 2.54 centimeters in one inch, so 0.0254 meters in one inch, so you have to multiply by 0.0254. When you do that, you find your speed is 0 0.53 meters per second at the edge of the record. Now, for fun, if you want to convert that into miles per hour, you do the conversion that there's 1,609 meters in one mile and 3,600 seconds in an hour, and if you do those two things, then you get 1.2 miles per hour. All right, so that's more about LPs than you ever wanted to know, I'm sure. Now, um, if the angular velocity of a rotating object changes, then, um, in other words, if it has an angular acceleration, then it also has a tangential acceleration, all right? Even if the angular velocity is constant, then each point on the object has a centripetal acceleration. So what these two different kinds of acceleration do is deal with the changing speed of the particle's rotation and also the changing direction of the particle's rotation. So if the angular speed is changing, your tangential acceleration A is equal to R times alpha. However, any object, even if the angular speed is not changing, has a centripetal acceleration or a radial acceleration. I use those terms kind of interchangeably. Um, and that we learned about a few chapters ago. The magnitude of that is V squared over R. If we plug in our new definition for our tangential speed, V is equal to R omega, then you can write that as R times omega squared, okay, for your uh, radial acceleration. So, 
you can have changes in a particle's motion that producing any kind of acceleration, you can change either the speed or the direction. If you change the speed, you have a tangential acceleration. If you change the direction, of course, you're moving in a circle, you're constantly changing the direction. That's a centripetal acceleration. Let's zoom in and kind of look at what's going on with one particle, okay? So let's say that a particle is going through a path, okay? The path is here in orange, and it's moving from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the screen. What it's doing is it's speeding up the whole time it's going through that path. It's accelerating. It's speeding up. Now, it's also changing direction, and the uh, turn that it goes through, if you want to uh, draw it out, you can draw a little circle that corresponds to the radius of curvature of that turn that it makes. So here, we've got our particle going through a turn, and it's turning up towards the top of our slide, all right? So the little circle is described here in blue. So because it's changing direction, it has a centripetal acceleration. That centripetal acceleration points towards the center of the circle. But the um, particle is also speeding up. It's speeding up tangent to that circle. And so that's here our tangential acceleration. Of course, because they're both accelerations, you can add those two vectors together to get your total acceleration. And that's shown here as the uh, purple line. Okay? So that's our total acceleration. Now, in the next turn, it's turning down towards the bottom of the slide. So here's the blue in the circle of the arc of a circle that's going through at that point. Here's the centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center of that circle, but it's still speeding up, and so it has a tangential acceleration tangent to that circle. If you add those two vectors together, you get the total acceleration, the vector in purple that kind of points down and to the right. And then here's the final one at point C. It's got a radial acceleration kind of pointing down and to the left and a tangential acceleration pointing down and to the right. And so this acceleration is almost straight down towards the bottom of the slide. Okay. So the resultant acceleration is the vector sum of the tangential acceleration and the centripetal acceleration. Okay. Remembering that the tangential is due to a changing speed, the centripetal is due, due to the changing direction. The total acceleration will be the vector sum. If you want the magnitude of the total acceleration, since um, the centripetal and the tangential accelerations will always be perpendicular to one another, you can use the Pythagorean theorem. The total acceleration will be the hypotenuse of the triangle uh, made by the centripetal and the radial accelerations. So to find the total, you do the square root of the sum of the squares of both of those accelerations. We can plug in the values that we have for the centripetal and the uh, tangential accelerations that we learned about today. So remember, a tangential acceleration is r times alpha, and our um, angular, our, our, our our tangential acceleration is r times alpha, and our centripetal acceleration is r times omega squared. If you plug in for both of those things and solve, then you get a total acceleration is equal to r times the square root of alpha squared plus omega to the fourth. So you can find your total acceleration this way. If you instead have your total acceleration, you can find your centripetal and your tangential just using some trig, um, which I'll show you here in this next example. So here in this example, um, it represents the total acceleration of a particle moving in a clockwise circle. Okay? The radius of the circle is 2.5 meters at a certain instant in time. So at that instant, they want you to find the radial tangential accelerations, um, the centripetal and the tangential, the angular acceleration, and the particle speed. And they also want to know whether the particle is speeding up or slowing down. So at this point, you see here, it's giving you the total acceleration vector in purple and showing you this tangential speed v here in red. Okay, You can see um, from the drawing that the angle in between the radius and the total acceleration is 30 degrees. And it gives you the magnitude of the total acceleration as 15 meters per second squared. So we can use trigonometry to solve for the um, tangential and the centripetal components to the total acceleration. So this triangle, in this triangle, the long leg of the triangle here would be the centripetal acceleration. And the short leg of the triangle would be the tangential acceleration, okay, the part that points tangent to the circle. So if this angle is 30 degrees, then the tangential acceleration will be 15 meters per second squared times the sine of 30 degrees using my trig, okay?
And that's because, of course, the sine is defined as the opposite over the hypotenuse. And the tangential acceleration lag is opposite to this 30 degree angle. So if I multiply those things together, I get 7.5 meters per second squared for my tangential acceleration. The problem also asks for the angular acceleration. Remember that your, your acceleration is equal to alpha times r. Okay, so to solve for alpha, you get the acceleration over r. Plugging that in, I get 7.5 meters per second squared divided by 2.5 meters. That gives me an angular acceleration of 3 radians per second squared. Now, my centripetal acceleration is the long leg of this triangle. That's going to be 15 meters per second squared times the cosine of 30 degrees. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Remember that. If I multiply those two things together, I get roughly 13 meters per second squared. Now I can use the centripetal acceleration to solve for what my tangential speed v is, because the centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r. Now I know a is equal to 13 meters per second squared, v is my unknown, and r is 2.5 meters, so my speed v is equal to the square root of 2.5 times 13, which gives me 5.7 meters per second squared. Now, you can kind of look at the drawing and figure out the last part. Since the acceleration here is kind of pointing almost straight down here in this picture, okay, and the uh, acceleration component there, if you did the vector addition, the tangential acceleration would be pointing tangent to the circle in the same direction as my velocity vector, okay? Since the acceleration and the velocity are in the same direction, that tells me that the object is speeding up. Okay, so let's talk about what the correspondence is between the linear and the rotational quantities. If an object is rotating, it goes through an arc length. A certain point will go through an arc length. If you want that um, arc length, it would be L is equal to R theta. If the object is rolling and translating, the arc length would give you also the distance traveled. Okay? And that would be X is equal to R theta. If the object is moving with an, and rolling with an angular velocity, omega, you can relate the tangential speed to omega. V is equal to R omega. And if there's a tangential acceleration, remember that that means the object is speeding up in its rotation, then the rotational analog to that is alpha, the angular acceleration, and the tangential acceleration is equal to r alpha. Let's talk about rolling motion, where an object is rolling and also translating. So for example, like the wheels on a car, the car wheels turn and that causes the car to move forward. In that case, um, the wheel is rolling without slipping. Let's just consider rolling without slipping, which means that there's no skidding, no ice, no mud, something like that. At that in that case, any point P touching the ground is going to be instantaneously at rest with respect to the ground. Think about it as the wheel rolls through without slipping, the wheel doesn't move with respect to the ground at that point, okay, at that point on the wheel. This means that static friction is actually acting to keep the wheel from slipping on the ground, okay? So what that means is that if the wheel goes through one full rotation, one full revolution, then the linear dis distance traveled by the wheel would be equal to the circumference of the wheel, okay? So that's how it works. That means that we can relate the linear speed of the wheel to its angular speed, v is equal to r omega. Let me do one final example here to explain how linear quantities relate to angular quantities. Let's say that you're pushing a wheelbarrow, and your wheelbarrow tire has a diameter of 12.5 inches. You're pushing a wheelbarrow across your yard, walking at 3 miles per hour, which is a pretty typical walking speed for a human. So how fast is your tire rotating in revolutions per minute? And how many revolutions has the tire completed if you push the wheelbarrow 100 yards? So, 3 miles per hour, this is kind of a little unit conversion game. So, 3 miles per hour, 1 hour is 60 minutes. I want to keep it in terms of minutes, right? So, that's how, where I'm going to stop there. But now, the diameter of my tire is given in inches. So, let's convert miles to inches. So, 1 mile is 5,280 feet, and 1 foot is 12 inches. So, that means that if I'm traveling at 3 miles per hour, that I'm traveling at 3,168 inches per minute.
Now, let's set that equal to r omega so we can figure out how fast our wheel is spinning. Remember that radians is a dimensionless quantity. So if I have inches in the left-hand side, I need inches on the right-hand side, okay? So I've got 3,168 inches per minute is equal to omega times 6.25 inches. It's 6.25 because the diameter of the tire is 12 inches, so the radius would be half that. Okay, if I solve for omega, I get omega is equal to 507 radians per minute. Remember, I've divided inches by inches, so I get the dimensionless quantity of radians. If instead I want that in terms of revolutions, there's 2 pi radians in 1 revolution. So if I divide 507 by 2 pi, I get 81 revolutions per minute. So that's how fast my tire is turning in revolutions per minute. Compare that to our LP, which is 33 and a third revolutions per minute. Fast. Okay, now let's talk about what angle it's gone through if the tire has traveled a distance linearly of 100 yards. So in that case, we're going to use our equation relating uh, the arc length um, and the angle. So there, theta is equal to L over R. Well, in this case, the arc length that the tire travels through, one point on the tire travels through, is also the linear distance that the tire travels through with respect to the center. So, converting 100 yards into um, inches, okay, so that I can divide it out and get the dimensionless quantity of radians, 100 yards, there's 3 feet in a yard and 12 inches in a foot. So, 100 times 3 times 12, okay. And then I want to divide out by the radius of my tire, which is 6.25 inches. In that case, I get the number of radians that the tire goes through, um, which is 576. And then I'm going to, to get revolutions, divide that number by 2 pi. So 576 divided by 2 pi gives me 91.7 revolutions, which is the number of revolutions that the tire goes through if you push that wheelbarrow 100 yards. Okay. So, um, hopefully that wasn't too terribly confusing, but if it is, we can resolve any lingering problems in class, and I'll see you there.